sits on your finger like a shield. Uh, and it's, right? It's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous ring. Is it, was that stone that your brother mined? Yes, it is. That's cool. It's actually the, the silversmith that made it is, um, I don't know if you know who, Michael Horace. I don't. He, was, he played Tonto back in the day. Oh my gosh. Not Twin Peaks. And, okay. But he uh, was a good friend of mine in the, in the Bay Area. So he did the silver work. Your yeah, brother mined the stone. When you talk to someone like him, and, and by all means, make sure that I, I get to your questions too. When, when you talk to someone about him, uh, when you talk to someone like him, uh, represented in in a way, and to, to watch the sort of cultural narrative um, shift and improve, still not there yet. Uh, but what do you do? You ever discuss that as as friends and as colleagues, or does that even come up? Um, it, it doesn't come up. That's, but I mean, it's. I mean, for me, that's where I got my inspiration was watching people like him yeah. and, and everybody else. Um, I mean, there, I know there is a fine line of, you know, the stereotypes and, that are out there in Hollywood, and you know what, it is changing. Yeah. Me personally, I can, I mean, for my character, I mean, for one is, you know, people are asking me how I kicked down the doors in Hollywood to do what I did by not playing such a stereotypical Native American role. And um, you know what, it's, I owe it all to Patty Jenkins. She was, you know what it was? It was the communication and the respect that she had for, for my culture. And, and um, so she gave me a lot of opportunity in, in developing my character. And it was, it was you, you have this professional arc that mirrors the way some of the best characters are when you see them on screen, right? It starts out as one thing, becomes another, perhaps it circles back. You you, you started with an interest, if, if I, and correct me if I'm wrong, you started with an interest in acting, then you got into stunt work, and now those worlds have come together. Can you just walk me through sort of professionally how you got into this line of work? So honestly, I, I, it was never, you know what, I was a little kid. Watching. I don't think you're ever little. You're like six foot five. <laughs> <laughs> I must have been, I don't even think I was 10 years old yet. Um, Geronimo, the movie came out with Wes Dooley. And there was, a, there was a man on there that I seen. His name is, oh my goodness, I can't remember. It's, it's on the tip of my tongue. I feel, um, but he was such a, uh, he was, Amazing. What looking him at a, on, on a horse, the Native American man. I was like, wow, impressive. And uh, I remember telling my sister, one day you're gonna see me on on, on TV riding a horse. And she slapped me in the head. And, <laughs> you know, laughed. It was, you know. But now that that circle's it's come full circle. So it's it's really nice to you know I get back in my community and then show them that that's possible. What was your first, before you got into to stunt work, did you have a sort of traditional acting role or what did you do, how did you end up, the whole thing is amazing because usually I feel like you kind of, you're either going to be a stunt person or you're going to be on camera. So again, you know what, that was, as a child, that's what I said, but I, you know what, it was, it was like saying, when I grow up, I'm gonna have a Lamborghini or I'm gonna, you know what I, I say I, that every day. <laughs> But you know what? You got to if you believe in your dreams, right? It's it's the law of attraction. If you only you only excel, it's always good to set a higher goal than you can possibly achieve. You exactly. always want to dream. Exactly. You know what? So, but anyways, my my first step into acting was actually there was a TV show in Canada called North of Sixty. There was an actor that committed suicide in, in real life. He was actually a friend of mine. So they were doing a theatrical show to, to show the signs of suicide. And I was actually approached by a casting director. And I had, you know, I was shy. I was, had no intention of becoming an actor. And they coerced me into coming in, and, and I got the part. So that was my first introduction, was, was theater. And again, I put it away for a while. And I wasn't making any money doing it, first of all. And, um, I got a couple extra roles, and again, it didn't pay very well. I started doing construction. I totally changed my 
my path, but I ended up going to a casting call and I was picked from the back of the line to be an extra in a, a film for HBO called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. And so that was a big break for me because the first day I was on set, I was approached by the stunt coordinator and asked if I could ride a horse. <laughs> I said, yeah. They're like, well, the horse might fall. There was a battle scene, right? We were fighting the cavalry. They had some bombs going off. And if I could handle the horse right, and, you know, that was the thing. I might fall with the horse. And uh, I said, yeah, no, no problem. So, I mean, I can honestly say I, I fell into the stunt business. Yeah, really. Did you, did you grow up um, with, with horses? Like, what we have heard is some other folks saying, yeah, I couldn't do any of those things. I just kept saying I could until I figured it out. Did you grow up with... When you said you could do that, could you actually? No, I could. I could ride horses. Okay. But, I mean, since then, though, my I, I've been trained to to fight, fall, and shoot guns, and do all that cool stuff on horses. I so after that project, I I took another step, another step, and I went to Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in Paris, France. This is yeah. I was there for a year where we do the it's the world's largest live dinner theater. And um, I mean, an amazing show at Disneyland. Um, chase live buffalo, and they're not tame either. They're, they're keep you on your toes. Yeah, I mean, it's a dangerous show. Definitely, it's a lot of stunt work, and that's where I was trained to fight, fall, and you know, ride standing on their backs and do all that, all that cool stuff. And um, yeah, I spent a year there. Came back to Canada, went back to Canada, and I was. There's not too many trained Native American stuntmen, so I was getting called for a lot of things. And um, yeah, getting a call for Revenant uh, prior to production to, to run a boot camp for some, for some new, new blood in the stunt industry. So I was really glad to you know, organize, help organize you know, maybe 60 guys, and we filtered it down to 20 young boys that could, again, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't. I don't want to say I trained them because they they all rode horseback, bareback, mind you, um, and, and they had great looks. And it was more of a, an etiquette into into the stunt business. So again, it was nice to bring some some new new blood into the stunt community. So when you watch the Revenant, the very beginning of the Revenant, the first six minutes, that was maybe six weeks of work with 70 stuntmen and you know maybe 50 horses and in the middle of November, December in Canada. Oh. It was, you know and it was the toughest film that I've ever done physically just because of the extreme temperatures and the you know the director was very demanding it was you know but it was Again, after watching it, I'm so thankful to be such a part of that that magic. And then along comes an opportunity for a film that nobody watched. Tell me about your time on the set of Wonder Woman. And you already mentioned your affinity for Patty. I'm just curious how that all came to be. You know what? It was it was amazing. You know what? It's for me right now. It's still surreal to be able to have that opportunity to share my language, you know, which has never been heard on that platform, and to bring to, and to give breath to, to a demigod, a Blackfoot demigod. And so Nappy was a character that I learned as a little kid. Those were the stories that I heard were Nappy stories, and there's hundreds of them. You know, there's good stories and there's bad stories. Just like a human being, he has all the emotions of a human being. And and um, so in every story as a little kid I hear, there would be a lesson that I would learn by watching him do what you're not supposed to do. So it was nice to, you know, it was, when I first met Patty, her first, her first conversation involved how I felt about being called chief. And, um, what a great first conversation to get you right to just be like this. Like, what is your feedback on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I had no idea, even, you know, that it was for Wonder Woman, and 
so I was like, geez, that, those are fighting words. And she said, well, based on DC comic book characters, um, we can't change that name. And I was like, DC comic book, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, you know, and, and she turned around and she said, you know what, out of respect to you and your culture, you never have to call yourself chief. Um, in fact, um, I'll let you speak your language and, and introduce yourself. And so, it was, again, it was much love to Patty for giving me that, that power in developing that character. When you were on set, is there any moment that stands out in your mind uh, as being either particularly fulfilling or funny or I'm, I'm looking for the dirt. I want to know what it's like to be on the set of that movie. It was, it was, it was really fun. It was a lot of laughs and, you know, but it was hard. Sometimes I was like, Chris is really funny. So you're Chris, Chris, Pine. Happy. <laughs> Chris Pine is so funny. I mean, but the thing is my wardrobe weighed over a hundred pounds. Really? And I mean, I, honestly, I had the, the old style pants that come up to below your armpits. But um, I had a. Which, and he's tall, that's why I weighed I so much. A shirt, suspenders, a vest, a, black, uh, a leather trench coat, and then another overcoat and a bag. So when Chris makes a joke during filming, we have to do it again, and I have to run around this. You know, there was times I was like, oh man. Stop, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so tired, and I had these boots that came up to here. Every, I mean, it was... You should have put him in that. You've been like, you know what, wardrobe? He's going to wear this for an hour, and I'm going to play the part of him. Here we no, go. It was a, we had a great time on set. The camaraderie was great. It was really cool to be such a part of... You know what, for me, it was nice to work with all of them. You know, it was like going to school. Yeah. You know, as an actor, to be able to watch them just off camera and, and or on camera and, and, and just be amazed to watch and see how you and Bremner just goes you know for me for me I'm used to playing that strong stoic character and to watch you and Bremner just lose it and have no backbone and just not care and just to go with the character and to show that deep emotion and that passion and it was such a great learning experience. So when I was doing, when I was like speaking of you, and um, when I was doing one room and I was getting other auditions, and I had nobody to read with except you and we're in the South England and in a small town in the middle of nowhere. And I, so I had to do this audition with him, and it was so hard, <laughs> just because it was you, Brandon. And, and but he gave me so much, so many pointers and so much uh, knowledge. It was great. It's nice when someone, when you have an opportunity to work on a film like that, but then also grow yourself professionally to, to have that sort of exposure. Uh, did you take any of your wardrobe with you when you left? Not that you're supposed to do that, but lots of people do. No, I didn't. You did, because you're, you could see, he's a good guy, you could tell. We have, like, we have this whole thing earlier today with like set klepto, um, who's like, oh, I took everything. I'm Lex Luthor in Smallville. You'd be amazed at all this stuff. And he's like, I've got an office full of it. <laughs> and if you've ever seen Battlestar Galactica, Katie Sackhoff, when she does her Comic Cons, tells some pretty funny stories about sneaking out her costume. She's like, there is not a chance I'm not leaving with this. I am Starbuck. <laughs> She's like, I am leaving with this. I did, I did have some of my own personal, my necklace and some different things that, that were part of my, uh, incorporated into my own. Uh, the necklace you're wearing right now? No. Okay. No, the joke that I had on. Okay. The Tell me. These earrings. The earrings and the. What's the story behind the necklace you're wearing? This is actually my own design. It's it's something I've worked with a, a silversmith down in New Mexico. It's, it's called the Brave Rock Collection. This is so cool. Um, actually, you know what? I there's these old style earrings they used to sell or, or trade in the trading forts, and they're called pendulum earrings. So they were in the shape of this here, and it was a cone that came down, and I wanted some. So I and you can't find them anymore. So I asked the silversmith to to, to make me some. I ended up making five of them and making this necklace and saying, hey, let's let's put this out there and 
call it the Ray Rock Collection, so I got my own jewelry line now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Like, that's really, really cool. When, when you're not working on, and if you guys have any questions, by all means, throw your hand up. So I do keep scanning the crowd, making sure I'm not dominating the conversation if you have something you want to ask. Um, when you, when you're not training, working on a film, what do you do in your free time? Like, what, what else makes you tick, creatively or otherwise? You know what? Recently, I've been traveling a lot, and it's it's my vacation is when I go home. Yeah. It's uh, you know what? It just gives me so much appreciation for home that I. When I'm home, the only place I go is to the airport to go somewhere else. So it's, it's, I'm really thankful that I have the opportunities that I do to, to, you know, learn other cultures, other languages, other beliefs, and you know, I mean, it's. I, I lived in France, and I didn't speak French. I lived there for a year. I spent some time in Budapest. And, you know, London was a culture shock. It's been. Uh, you know what I've, I, I've learned is Europe is amazing. The, you know, everybody knows five different languages. And, you know, I think that I wish, you know, here, being Native American land, here in Portland, I think this would be the, you know, I, I think that's important in Native culture when we're somewhere we always acknowledge uh, the people whose land we stand on. They do that frequently in Canada. I don't have to tell you, but you hear that a lot. This would be why I like my own Chinook. So it's, it's a beautiful place. Portland is great. I'm glad you think it's beautiful. We're quite fond of it. I think it's nice that, you know, in doing that, you know what I've learned? I've learned how to speak so many different things. And even just saying hello is so important or thank you. It'd be nice if people in America could learn the language of the people whose land they stand on, even if it's just hello. So the first thing I do when I travel out of the country is I stop by the concierge and I pick up like five phrases. So to this day, because I covered the Olympics in Greece, I can say cute puppy in Greek, which is haditumenaskilaki. And you would be amazed. That's the, oh, that I can say red wine too. But uh, the, point is, um, the point is in that is that you'd be amazed at people's reactions when you make just a little bit of effort. And I'm wondering if, and I see a question, which I will come to you here in just a second. Um, can you teach me to say something in your native tongue? And that could be a phrase of your choosing. Is it, will it be difficult for me to attempt? We'll see. Okay, let's try. So, <laughs> teach okay, me. we'll go back to Wonder Woman. My first word was uki. Uki. Uki is hello. Uki. Did I do it? Yeah. Sounds right? It usually never sounds right. <laughs> so, <laughs> my first words were uki nistu nitaniku, Oop. which is hello, this, hello my name is. So nistu, nistu, nitaniku, nitaniku, nistu, nitaniku. That's how long my name is. Nistu, nitaniku, Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> that was cool. That was really cool. Thanks, man. Thanks. I'll come to you next. You sir in the back, just yell it out so I can hear you. Sure. How was taking on a role in a comic book movie different than the other roles that you've had in the past? Sorry, I didn't. First of all, I. I don't know, just off the top of my head, first thing, I wasn't, I didn't have war paint on and I wasn't coming out of the bush with a tomahawk. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good answer. Over here. What do you think about the theories that um, Chief is actually a god and that would you come back to the franchise and ask I'll leave that up to the business gods at Warner Brothers. <laughs> Good question. If you could travel, since we're speaking about your time in France, and I would have assumed, I feel like I have a, t I have a ton of Canadian friends, and if you so much as have one toe in that country, you probably speak some French, so I was surprised to hear you say that you didn't speak French. No, why? Because my grandmother took me out of the, the class. Because it is, it is required. Yeah. But my grandmother was like, he barely knows his own language. Why wouldn't he learn French? <laughs> Grandma said, here's how this is going to go. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I've, since then, I, I mean, I, I'm, 
I'm not fluent, but I can understand it fluent. And so it's, you know, language is huge for me, having that opportunity to share my language. So now I'm writing children's books, or, or not just children, just build books to learn my language. So that's just it's beautiful. Every time I wasn't ex I wasn't expecting that, and I always definitely like to be surprised. So between a jewelry line representing jewelry that is of historical importance that you couldn't find, between writing books to help preserve and celebrate your language, is this where you tell me you're like also a race car driver, or <laughs> what other am I thing am I not asking you that you're doing? I am coming out with a fleet CD. With a what? A flute CD. Are you serious? Yeah, I, I play a, a red cedar flute. Yeah. Overachiever, but so stoic about it. It's amazing. I'd be like, here's the 16 things I'm doing. That's really cool. When did you pick that up? Was that something your grandma told you you're going to? No, actually, so the flute actually comes from the South, right? And I, I want to take this on as a gift that, you know, as different tribes traveled back in the day, you know, we weren't just warring tribes. We would trade. We would trade medicines. We would trade jewelry. We would trade knowledge. And, and so for me, this was a, it was actually a friend of mine had a flute on his dashboard and asked if I could play it. And, and to be honest, it was, I can literally say it was a gift from the creator that I, because I picked it up and, and played it like I knew how to play and I did it. So to this day, I, I can pick up my flute and just jam it out. Like you know, what? I've never taken a lesson in my life. But. Oh, I have. I have such um, well, healthy envy. Like I don't. Wanna, but you know, like for someone just to be able to just automatically pick something like that up. That's that's incredibly cool. If if you could travel, since you've been to Budapest, you've been to France, and you've been to London, and, and lots of places in Europe, where's one place you haven't been that you would like to go? I've been meaning for last couple years to go to New Zealand. Yeah. And you know what I think? Talk to Carl Urban. He's from there. So I think. I want to go to Asia too as well. Yeah. Now we just have to, I'm trying to figure out, I'm like, what, what, what film project do I want to put him into? You ma'am with the bow in your hair first. I see a bunch of hands that <laughs> will come around. I'll get to everybody. Hi. Um, I was wondering if in your future roles there are any other things about Native American representation and or the culture that you would like to see more in future movies or in future characters? Can you repeat the end of that question? A little louder, sorry. Yeah. I was wondering that in future movies, would you like to see more, like what would you like to see more of represented in Native American representation and or culture? You know what, I think it is happening. By that I mean by having more writers, directors, producers, actors. I think, um, We're getting that opportunity to tell our own stories, and that's what should happen. So I'm thankful to be a part of it, and, and you know, down the road, maybe directing my own stuff. I have no I'm doubt. Actually, I'm actually an executive producer on a show right now called Reign of Judges, which is another really awesome award. <laughs> <laughs> because of course it is. How is how is it? What is it like? Which role now that you do? Uh, behind the camera stuff with that, and you do well, and you did some on camera work with that too, right? But I mean, what what do you prefer? Honestly, I prefer doing stunts. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's the easiest. <laughs> awesome. But it's but it's you know what I, I know I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> it is take it does take you know I, it's, it is such a dangerous job. I've had friends that broke their back and some serious injuries, so I, I think it's time to, you know, unfortunately put it away and, and uh, get some new, new blood in the business. So, it's good. And I will come around to everybody. Question to you. Okay.
right on. You know what? Again, I'm so thankful to to represent our people and to you know what? It's the it's the first time that a Native American has been brought to light as a hero figure, and it's all time. I like that you speak up for Mackenzie. That's good. That's good. <laughs> it's a good embarrassment, though, when it involves something as awesome as this. To make it feel right to me, I, I brought, so again, I, I was, I brought Noppy to, I brought a piece of my culture, a piece of, a piece of, you know, stories that I grew up with as a kid. I brought those back. You don't hear those stories anymore. So that, personally, for me to have that opportunity to bring him back is something that I think is, is really honorable and, and it, it means something. It's not just a comic book story. In our culture, it's oral tradition, right? It's storytelling. That's how lessons are learned. And you know what? I learned a bunch of cool things about oral tradition recently. And, and learning about the, you know, the reasons why we have oral tradition. It's so important to teach your children the things that you were taught. Or, or for me, like I'm saying this because my grandmother taught me. And it, it, it's, you learn things with a sense of, and you also, there's protocols to learning things, and you, and you understand that, and, and you have that respect and sacredness for it. There's things now that I realize that can't be taught in books, and, and it's something that, you know, I think that's maybe why our, our, a lot of our culture is oral. So you, you remain, you keep that sacredness to what you're learning. This day and age, I think, you know, with all the knowledge at our fingertips, we're dying of ignorance, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't have that that respect anymore for, for the knowledge. Great question. I'm gonna make sure who else has questions so I know how fast I need to move through these. We have a lot. Okay, we'll start with you in the back and I'm gonna work my way down this way. Go ahead. Nice and loud. The book I'm called, writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the book that comes to mind when you first said that was a book called My Life is My Sundance by Leonard Peltier. Mm -hmm. All right, moving down this way. Uh, you in the front and then you second. Decoration well, it was stuff. 75 years in the making, yeah, yeah, definitely. And to have Patty at the at the helm was another amazing. Yeah. Was, was that uh, spirit kind of translated on the set? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, like I said, if it was a male that directed, I don't think it would have done what, done what it did. You, yeah. Um, I've really loud, guys. It's hard to hear up here. It's me in China. I go over to like England and they make really horrible American jokes look down their nose at you and then when no one's looking they ask you to talk surfer, right? <laughs> so in your travels, what's kind of the what are some of your funnier or more heartwarming experiences in terms of like being, you know, Native American, what people expect, how it turns out, you know, and then how has it changed over time? That's that's a tricky question because it depends on where you're at and, and I mean I don't know. There's times in the last 
month in California, and someone was like, are you a real Indian? <laughs> no. It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and I was at a powwow. So it's, are you kidding me? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, kudos for them, I guess, for going there to try to learn something, even if the message perhaps was not received. It's good for you. Let's uh, continue on. I want to make sure we get to him before this panel concludes. In the back, yes. Uh, real loud. tough business to get into and it's it's good to I mean, it's, it, it is a, I mean you have to have some special qualities if you want to whether it's riding a horse or shooting a gun or, or you got to become specialized in something to put your foot in the door and then it's it's a matter of meeting people and and having that right etiquette work etiquette to, to be in the stunt business because it, there is a big work etiquette to it if, if you show up and, and you want to be a stuntman and you get hurt and, and I mean, if you get hurt, I mean, there's times where I've gotten hurt, and but I had to work the next day. I, I, you know what? I had no choice. I had to work the next day. That's the etiquette of the business. You have to, <laughs> you have to muscle up and, and be tough about it. That's the life of a stuntman. You, sir. Oh, all right, dear, I won't forget. Okay, uh, stunt question, double-sided. What's your favorite stunt that you've ever performed? I like it. And second side of it is, what's the worst injury you've ever got doing a stunt? I like it too. Stunt, um, for me personally, I like the, the stunt, it's called a, a rescue relay, where you would jump on the back of a moving horse, somebody comes by you, either they have a neck rope on the or, or, you, or you reach out your arm and you grab the arm and you jump on the back of the horse. So actually it was a race that we did in Buffalo Bills Wild West show. Two guys go out in the middle of the arena, two guys on the back on horseback, and they race around and as they turn the corner around you, you jump on the back. And then when you get to the finish line, you jump off and you run back and you do it again. Whoa. Whoa. So I mean it's, on a, and again, that, that was, you know, I've seen a guy break his back doing that. I've seen a guy get um, lose his scalp. He, he jumped over the horse, and his head hit a hit a pillar. And um, yeah, it was yeah. That's great. But so again, my the hardest stunt or the most painful stunt I did was I got blown up on Hell on Wheels. A, a, simu, a cannon shooting me, so they had a mortar in the ground and I stepped over the mortar and my cue was to jump. Like, as soon as my leg came off the ground and bent, they would push the button on the explosion. And uh, I fell maybe from here to the sign right there. Um, I had a bunch of powder burns on my legs, which you know, and, and again, I had to work the next day. Uh, the doctor was like, I can give you some pain medication, but I have to take you to the hospital. And I knew if I actually seen a real doctor, they would have said, no, you're done. And, and so I had to take an Advil and jump back out there and die right away again. So. Dude. Yeah, how on wheels I died over a hundred times. <laughs> How's it, like, you know what we're gonna do? We're just gonna set this mortar off just as soon as you, like that's, oh man, your question. Um, uh, so I on occasion work with uh, native youth uh, from Oregon, Washington and Idaho. Um, and some of them have expressed interest in uh, going into this film industry. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, as a native actor, and uh, industry person, do you have any advice uh, for someone, uh, for native uh, youth going in into that field maybe, and what they should keep in mind in such such a colonized sort of uh, industry? You know what, I think first of all, you need to get an agent, whether that's just a background casting agent, um, 
I think as any kind of experience is, is great, whether it's theater, um, dance, um, you know, whether you play music, like I said, if you specialize in anything, you know, again, for me, like growing up, shooting bow and arrows, throwing toms, just stuff that I like to do, hunting, those are all special skills that add to, to whatever you're bringing to, to camera. And, and um, again, take every opportunity that you can. For me, again, I think my values and in, in my traditional values, you know, like having long hair, speaking my language, riding horses, um, singing and dancing, that's what's taken me around the world and made me who I am today. You don't have to lose those traditional values to succeed. So I, I encourage you know, all, all our youth to keep those values close and, and represent the right way. Definitely. It's, it's, our people were nomadic and I think, you know, people ask me where I come from. You know what, I don't say the res, I say I come from Blackfoot country because before all this, that's what it was, was it's an Indian country and we, we need to be proud of who we are and, and uh, remember that. So I think it's, it's important in, in that representation and being an actor, Indian actor. You know what, again, that's a big question that comes to me lately is how do I feel about non-native actors playing these roles? And it's, I think that, that we should play these roles, but again, speaking from a different point as an actor, look at Cliff Curtis. He's played every race in the book. And, and as an actor, I'd love to do that where it doesn't matter that I'm Native American, that I could play something else. So it's, it is a two-sided question. My own question, I guess, that I just asked. <laughs> I like it, I like it. Well, you have time for one more. Uh, so the documentary Real Engine came out a few years ago and it kind of shows the portrayal of indigenous people in uh, film and in TV. Uh, what's your favorite contemporary representation of indigenous people of North America? Like you were talking about North of 60, that was somewhat contemporary. Uh, Smoke Sinkles is a great movie, but like what's your... I'm a fan of all that stuff. Yeah. I mean of all the actors that, you know, I'm, again, I'm thankful that I've, I'm able to have worked with the majority of the actors that I grew up admiring and then idolizing. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you, you named it right there, Smoke Signals is a good contemporary one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna do, I, I do this with everyone up here on the set. I wanna do two selfies with you, and there's a reason why I say two. So I'll come sit by you. This is the first one. I hope you guys get a kick out of the second. Okay, smile. Thank you. I'll do it three times. Oh, that's a zit on my chin. Good grief. <laughs> okay, and then the other one that I want to do, if you'll stand for me, there's a reason. If any of you guys ever saw me on the morning news, this is the just the standard, just stay tall. <laughs> Got it. It's just his chest. Thank you so much. What a joy. Thank you. Stay Thank you everyone, thank you very much.